Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Q1 uh, 2023 quarterly conference call. Um, if you want to use this presentation for anything, please go ahead and read the disclaimer at the bottom of this, uh, this slide. So um, in this presentation, I'll talk a bit about my background, then my investment strategy, um, what I have in my portfolio. And then finally, I'll go through the many questions that I've received over the past week uh, on eToro. And also there'll be an opportunity to ask questions in the chat. So the reason, one of the reasons that uh, so many people are copying me on eToro is that since 2013, I've had an average annual return on investments over 25%. And that's really better than anyone you could fairly compare with. If you wanted higher returns than that in that period, you would effectively have to take on a lot more risk because I've also had a lower uh, risk to return ratio in that period. My background is that I started my career out as a management consultant, advising some of the largest companies in the world, including tech companies and banks. One of the products I worked the most with was valuations. So calculating what a company is really worth. That's very useful to large companies because at the end of the day, the value of the company may to some extent determine the share price, which may in the end determine the CEO's own salary. But it's also very relevant if you want to understand whether one direction or another is going to create value for the company. And if you know buying one company or buying a different one is really the smartest thing to do. Then uh, as I was making more money than I was spending while working as a consultant, I uh, started investing my money on eToro. As that kept going very well, eventually I was making more money from my investments than I was from my consulting work. And then I decided to focus 100% on managing my investments on eToro. And since then, I've become the most copied popular investor on eToro with more than 20,000 copiers and uh, more than 60 million US dollars uh, copying my portfolio. Now, I don't do everything on my own. I have some great assistants that help me with updating this presentation, financial analysis, giving me new insights on things that I want to learn more about. I also have a great network of experts that I trust on various topics. If I invest in something, I have to either myself be an expert or I have to know someone who is because otherwise I simply cannot get to the insights that I need quickly enough. Then I get really strong support from eToro. Whenever I have any questions or concerns, they're always really fast to provide a large amount of help. And uh, one of the great things, for instance, that eToro has, uh, is offering us is a, a network service. So if I, for instance, want to speak with the, one of the top people from one of the largest companies in China or America, anywhere, then I can just write that in the tool and then they organize the meeting. And then I can ask all my questions and learn a lot about something really quickly. I also subscribe to all the best data tools so that I have you know, running automatically into my financial models, the best uh, data available. And then finally, I'll highlight my three favorite experts, my three brothers. One of them is the CEO of a marketing company. One is a great economist at the Danish Ministry of Finance. And the last one is a computer scientist uh, specialized in AI, although now working mostly in charity. So if I have any questions or concerns in these areas, they are my uh, go-to guys. Then my investment strategy is based on some principles that have been there all along and are here now and will likely uh, always be there. I focus on macroeconomics. So that means that I look at all the different pockets of the global capital markets and evaluate what kind of growth rates I think the different pockets can have. I look for mega trends. So that means trends that can grow by more than 10% per year for more than 10 years or an equivalent of that. I look at fundamentals. That means evaluating what a company is really worth, trying to understand their products, what it's like to work there, what it's like to be a customer, what their strategic options are, what their financial statements looks like, how their competitors can respond if they do various things and so forth. Really getting a 360 degree view of the companies and then overall using that to make a valuation of the company, comparing that to what the company is priced at in the market and then investing in companies that I think are worth a lot more than they cost. I focus on the long term. That's the most counterintuitive of these principles and the most difficult one to understand. But effectively, if you want to um, run an investment portfolio or a company or your life, you really in practice do better by ignoring everything that won't matter 10 years from now. It really frees up your mind and your modeling ability and focuses in the kind of questions you ask when you ignore the short term and you just focus on what's going to matter in the long term. And then before you know it, actually, you did better in the short term as well. There's a great quote by Benjamin Graham, the author of the famous book, The Intelligent Investor. And he was also sort of the mentor of Warren Buffett. And he said that in the short term, the market is a voting machine in the long term, a weighing machine. And that effectively means that in the short term, it can be very important what 
uh, some people think, other people think, that other people think. But in the long term, if a company becomes really big and profitable and you own a big part of that company, then that's just very good. You don't even have to sell the company. You just have to be an owner of a large profitable company. That's an amazing thing to become. Then I focus a lot on risk management. Um, that means diversifying across different uh, geographies, industries, and business models. Um, it means uh, that no uh, single investment of mine makes up more than 5% of the portfolio at the moment. And generally, they don't do that, except if they have a very specific risk property, you know, where actually investing more in one asset could cause the overall risk to go down. And finally, I hitch against uh, tail risks. So those are risks that are quite unlikely to materialize, but if they do, they'll have an outsized impact. So for each of those identified risks, I like to have at least one position that I think could do really well in such a scenario and then uh, protect uh, my portfolio and reduce my overall risk. Finally, I focus on keeping fees low. That means that I'm always very aware of what the fees are and I avoid shorting, leverage, high fee instruments, and I keep a low trade frequency. Now I pay the same fees on eToro as the people that copy me. So by keeping my fees low, I keep everybody's fees low. And keeping the fees low is effectively just one more way of squeezing a bit more profitability out of one's portfolio. Then there are some areas in which I uh, find great opportunities for investments. I like companies that are able to deliver organic growth. That means selling more products or increasing the price of their products by more than the prevailing inflation rate. But it does not uh, mean companies that are just growing through acquisitions. So quite often in the annual report of a company, you can read that the company grew by 2% this year. And yes, that's true, but that's actually just because you acquired another company. The core business actually shrunk by 4%. So it's really not that impressive what this company has accomplished in that period. If a company, on the other hand, um, uh, acquires companies and then afterwards really improves those companies, make them bigger and better, and actually derive some synergies from the acquisitions or just make really smart acquisitions, then that growth that comes after is organic growth. And that's very nice. That can be impressive. But there are certain things that can look on the paper impressive that really uh, is not impressive. I like companies that are resilient. That means they can do well across many different scenarios, not just in the base case or the best case. I like companies that have strong, sustainable competitive advantages. That means that if they are in the pole position in their industry, they can keep that pole position. If they are sort of, you know, not in the pole position, they have a clear path to get there. They are, you know, improving themselves in a way that will get them in that good position eventually. I like companies that are delivering true value, true profitability. That means companies that are able in the future to provide real cash flows and ideally are able to reinvest those cash flows into their own business to grow their cash flows even further in the future. Then I like companies that uh, have a new good strategy. Sometimes companies say they have a new strategy and often it's not the case. So I like to see some real um, bold steps undertaken by the company that prove to me that this is a real new strategy. I saw, for instance, one company that announced their big plan for how sustainable they were going to be by the year 2050. What I'm really reading is that, okay, that's my uh, successes problem. We are not really going to do anything. And certainly last year we did nothing. That to me is not a new strategy. I need to see some real actions to prove to me that there is a new strategy. Then if you want to understand the future, the starting point is understanding the present. Many people don't even understand the present. You'll often hear them be really amazed about, wow, can you believe all the things you can do today with a smartphone? Yes, I can believe that. I could believe that a long time ago. Some people have not really even caught up to what's in the present, and they are usually the worst at predicting the future. Um, one example of, uh, of, of failing at that was uh, when Steve Ballmer, the former CEO of Microsoft, he held the first iPhone in his hand. And he said, you know, it doesn't have a keyboard. It's too expensive. Business customers won't like it. And I'm very comfortable with our position. And he was, of course, proven completely wrong by the success of the iPhone. But that was an example of holding the Blockbuster product in your hand and just not being able to see that that's the Blockbuster product. Many people have recently made the same mistake with Tesla. Um, if you're a smart shopper, you know, you buy the right product. You just keep making the right decisions on what you buy. You understand why one product is better than another product, why these features are important, and why these are not, why that's a good deal, that's not a good deal then you have a much better chance of actually understanding companies. If you cannot even understand the products, then it's very hard to actually also understand the companies behind those products. And yeah, if you understand that that's one piece of the puzzle you've managed to fit in, and then you just got to sort of fit the rest in as well. Finally, I like companies that are mission-driven, not, not just because I sometimes believe in that mission, but because it can be a great way to attract and keep great employees without overpaying them. 
You have some companies that are just magnets for talent, the smartest, most hardworking people. They name those companies as where they want to work. And there are other companies where the best people, they just can't wait to get out of there. And whether a company is in one camp or the other, or is potentially moving towards one camp or the other, that may not show up in the financial statements next quarter, but a few years down the line, it, it certainly will. Then my portfolio in Toro is primarily a stock portfolio. I also have a property that I rent out, and many people that copy me probably have some properties as well and some stocks. And that makes very good sense because stocks have historically been the best asset class and properties has been the second one. Historically, bonds were quite okay as well, but given the quite high prevailing inflation rate and the not too high yet interest rates we're seeing, bonds do not currently appear to be that great of an, an asset class. Commodities have historically done next to nothing. They've been okay in recent years, in the past few decades, and potentially could do okay in the future, but not great. Finally, currencies have historically been terrible. They're currently terrible. And I think it's safe to say that currencies will continue to be terrible. Effectively, because the total money supply keeps expanding, that's the key driver of inflation. And that just means that if you hold one US dollar and you hold that for a long time, your purchasing power is getting eroded. So whenever I have a lot of uh, idle cash, I like to get a transition left from this chart as fast as possible and ideally into some stocks. Then there are some big factors that are the ones that are really creating uh, economic growth in the world. I like to split those into the physical realm, the social realm, and the tech realm. So in the physical world, I try to understand what's all around us. How many trees are there in the world and where? How, many, uh, how much of the different metals do we have in different places? How much oil and gas is there here and there? Then I like to understand animals and life. How many people are we in different places? How old are they? How are the demographics changing? Of course, the companies that have the right products for the right demographics in the right location, they have an advantage. Then the uh, area where the most value can most often be created or destroyed the fastest is in the realm of the, the social. So um, money, bonds, stocks, a deed to a property, you know, a document that says you own your house or some digits on the screen that says the same. All of those only have value if we all believe they have value and we act based on that. If we stop believing in any of these, then all of that value can disappear very quickly. If we believe in these, however, then they can help us transact with one another, cooperate, and together create a lot of value. Then why does something have value? Sometimes that can really change. We all might agree that houses are valuable, but if everybody suddenly decided they only wanted to live in tents and nobody wanted to live in a house, nobody wanted to look in a house, then houses wouldn't have any value anymore. When our values change. You want to have those things that are becoming more valuable. And if you can find something that's growing at a high rate, even if it's coming from a small niche of society, that can suddenly be something you're seeing everywhere. And then getting in in the right way at the right time can really be beneficial to a portfolio. Then finally, there's the realm of technology, all the way from the deepest pit of the R&D labs, where we are developing the newer uh, scientific breakthroughs, especially the foundational technologies, you know, going from the agricultural revolution to the industrial era to suddenly getting the internal combustion engine, electronics, the digital era. And now, you know, maybe the, the age of AI is upon us. Then there's also the more uh, practical day-to-day uh, -day incremental innovation where companies and people are just doing the same thing slightly better over time. Some companies are doing this really well. They're sort of building up technical assets. They are just, just raising, raising slowly ahead of their competition by doing things better and better and better. There are others where things are slowly falling apart. And yeah, again, if a company is one or the other came, you may not see that in the short term, but you will in the long term. Then from all of those big factors that really drive the big economic uh, growth rates, we can look at how that looks in the world today. So the growth rates across the world are lower than uh, they've been historically on average. And, you know, especially in some places, it's sort of ground to a complete halt. There is certainly some probability, according to all economists and financial forecasters, of a recession in the, in the next year. And potentially things actually were worse in 2022 than, uh, than uh, the numbers shown at the time uh, showed us. Unemployment is, uh, is higher than it should be in many places. And also there's a little bit of a, a lag. So many um, companies that have announced layoffs, those aren't in the numbers yet. But you know, as those layoffs get executed, potentially that could indicate a bad direction for unemployment. Interest rates are lower than they've been on average historically, but they are higher than they've been in recent years and they are rising. And potentially at the 
you know, at the end of this uh, hiking cycle, we've sort of been seeing forecasts go higher and higher and higher. You know, maybe now we'll say that at the the the, the Fed's going to end the hiking cycle at 5.25%. And, you know, now maybe some people say a lot higher numbers to get some attention and whatnot. But um, that's, of course, all to deal with the inflation that's been uh, too high for too long. And then there's the added problem with inflation now that um, in, in general, everybody's been using their models and those models um, have been constantly predicting inflation to uh, come in lower than it has. And so even though people haven't adjusted the models, everybody sort of adjusted um, what they sort of, you know, if you have a gun and you keep shooting too far to the left, at some point you might just say, I don't know why or what is wrong with my gun, but I just got to aim it more right because I keep getting this wrong. And sort of that, you know, our models would say that inflation should have come down by now, but it just hasn't. And so you got to, people got to adjust their view on that. So potentially it will be higher for longer, even though there's no real basis in economic theory for us for saying that. Then there are some mega trends that I've identified as extra interesting. So if a company is uh, riding on the wave of uh, really driving uh, this uh, mega trend, then it's more likely to be found in my portfolio. So firstly, I'll focus on the nice to haves. So when we humans have it all, we like to uh, have fun and compete in amazing games and then who can have the better fashion. And that's really nice. And, you know, I certainly wish for a future where there can be much more on this and much less of, uh, of all sorts of problems. But the nice to haves can only stand on the shoulders of the need to haves. If we don't have security, then we have nothing. We need the energy, need the weapons and so forth to defend the world that can provide for all of these nice to haves. And finally, if you don't have your health, you have nothing. You cannot achieve anything. You cannot do any of these things if you don't have your health. And the companies that are really uh, having the keys to provide these things, they are to be found in the portfolio. Then there are the enablers and accelerators that can really make these things happen uh, better, faster, cheaper. Firstly, uh, there is uh, the companies that have made the biggest breakthroughs in the past years in deep learning. They are to be found in the portfolio and the companies that are making the next generation of the most amazing devices that will enable us to do the, you know, uh, the same things better and, uh, and new things. Then when you've identified some companies that you know, are potentially uh, all... Uh, in a mega trend together or maybe in an industry together or you know for whatever reason a group of companies and you want to get a quick overview of them a great way to do that is to look at the multiples so this is an example of uh, mama uh, or the big tech companies microsoft uh, apple meta alphabet and amazon i used to have netflix in this one i sold my netflix shares a long time ago when they changed their strategy and uh, maybe i should have taken them out of the fang presentation back then as well because effectively Netflix decided to be more of a movie and TV production studio than a tech company. And um, yeah, Microsoft has all along been a tech company. But if you look at the top left uh, chart here, we can see that all of them have uh, had amazing uh, profit margins, but especially Microsoft and Amazon's lagging quite a bit behind. In terms of growth rate, none of them are achieving those uh, double digit growth rates that we were used to back in the day. They have all sort of stagnated. The two top charts here, the higher, the better, because they're about profitability and growth. But the two bottom charts, the lower, the better, because they're effectively about price. So at the bottom left, we can see that um, for, every dollar, for every dollar of profit that Microsoft has, we have to pay $26 in enterprise value when we invest. So that's sort of okay. For Meta, we are paying a lot less. But for Amazon, we are paying a lot, lot more. Now, we'd only want to pay that much more for uh, Amazon if we think that they can improve this profit margin or maybe uh, improve or sustain their growth rate for longer or something like that. Otherwise, we wouldn't want to be paying that much more. And if we look at the, um, how, what we're paying compared to the revenue, we can see we are paying $11 for every dollar of revenue that Microsoft uh, has. So that's quite high but they're also getting a lot more profitability out of each dollar of revenue. Amazon, for them, we're only paying $2 for every dollar of revenue, but they're again not squeezing that much profitability out of every dollar of revenue. So that's overall a way to sort of get a, a quick overview of some companies. Most of the time, I don't look at nice charts. I just look at giant data tables. For whatever reason, that seems to work best for me. That's how I like to uh, look at the world. Most of these data tables come in uh, automatically via my data providers, and some of them are updated by my team or myself. 
um, using our subjective insights. So, you know, things can be subjective, but numerical. So I might score, you know, how nice is the CEO on a scale from uh, one to 10. I can also ask ChatGPT to rank different things and give numbers in that way. And that combined enables me to conduct all my analysis to rank all the companies for how good they are and score them on so many different things. And how, that all stacks up to, a, you know, always provide me with a, a list of how good all the companies are to invest in and how they fit together risk-wise. I conduct all my risk scenarios to see how different companies could perform under different circumstances. And then that helps me to put together a portfolio that can achieve what I think is the highest potential return at that medium risk level that I target. All of uh, those analysis are then uh, used for me to make decisions those can be one of two types. Either it's a research decision. So I see something. This tells me that I need to learn more about something. Then I go out and I learn about that. Maybe I need to uh, take in some more data in my models. Maybe I need to change how things work. That causes my analysis to change. Maybe there are some different risks that I see or some new ideas that cause me to make more research. And that goes around and around in a circle every day. And then a part of that good circle comes my investment decisions. So that might mean that there is a company that I'm investing in and I realize I need to invest even more or maybe reduce my holding or eliminate it entirely. Or maybe there's a new company I've not invested in before that I need to add to the portfolio. And when you add up all those investment decisions, then that becomes my portfolio. And if you compare that with the US economy, you can see that in the US, it's not just one industry that's providing all the economic activity. There's economic activity across many different industries and great investment opportunities in many different industries. And my portfolio is also split across many different industries with a slight bias towards tech, metals and mining, climate change, uh, fighting you know, renewable energy and climate tech, healthcare and uh, financial services. And the largest uh, companies in the portfolio right now are UBS, First Solar and Centene. And you can always go on eToro and see my full portfolio. That's, uh, that's always uh, open for everybody to see. That was my uh, presentation. Thank you everybody for listening so far. I'll now go through the questions that I've received in the past week. And then uh, after those, I'll take some uh, questions from the chat. So firstly, um, Oh, and just to saying, so I rephrase some of the questions or shorten them a bit. And sometimes if someone asks multiple questions, I've broken it into, a, into separate ones. So firstly, how do you handle the psychological challenges of investing? So 15 years ago, a university professor of mine here mentioned a list of, I think at the time it was 163 different cognitive biases. So I went home and I looked at this list and tried really hard to find out how I could eliminate all these 163 cognitive biases from my thinking. So that included stuff like, oh, you know, if you hear a large number, this could impact how you think about numbers. So you don't want to be anchored like that. So you got to re-anchor. Don't want to make any particular decisions when you're hungry because that could influence it. Or maybe you do want to be hungry, but at least you want to understand how being hungry or not hungry influences your decisions and so forth. I looked recently and I think that list of 163 cognitive biases have been expanded to 183. So there is maybe an exercise down the line for me to uh, go and look at those uh, 20 new ones and see that I'm not uh, biased in those ways. And I think in general, you know, if you just have to make a decision right now on something without thinking too much about it, it's going to be very important, you know, with your psychology. But if instead, you know, you think hard about it, you talk to someone about it, you write down all of the factors that are irrelevant and how all of those factors relate to one another. You think about many different options when you score them in many different ways, then you leave it for some time, you come back to it, you evaluate it further, you talk with more people. And then at the end of the day, that's what's, you know, then you make a decision based off of, you know, a lot, a lot of input, a lot of hard work, a lot of thought. If you've gone through all of that, how you felt at any given time or, you know, whether you were hungry, or not here, or whether you were anchored to that number, had heard that recently, I had this discussion last night or something like that, that's going to impact your decision much, much less than if you were just, you know, asked to, uh, you have to make a decision right now. And so sort of because I'm working with such frameworks, it just means that, that, you know, I'm not going to panic sell because I didn't have lunch or something like that. Um, and then you could add to that as well, that I do also make outsized return because of others, uh, a bad way of dealing with this. So there are other people that probably tend to, you know, uh, 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 panic sell at a time when I've been able, I'm able to buy from them at a, at a better price and so forth. So the, the fact of others being worse investors because of psychology potentially gives a benefit to me from, I think, being being less exposed to that. But then, yeah, maybe uh, when, maybe in those 20 uh, uh, cognitive biases that I'm not aware of, there could be some, uh, some, uh, some uh, problems that I'm not even uh, aware that I have that are, you know, psychological challenges that I should probably deal with.
What have been the biggest changes in the portfolio recently? So over the past year, the biggest changes have been a reduction in tech and some individual positions that were for sort of individual reasons. Um, and then I've added much more in, in metals and mining and also some uh, real estate investment trusts. Um, what do you think of Tilray? So Tilray is one of the positions that I've uh, closed in the past year. Um, I've uh, you know, been an investor in the cannabis industry since the beginning, back when you were investing in just you know a, a little farmhouse with a small field around it. And uh, that did, you know, did very well. And I managed to sell near the top and buy it back near the bottom. The company that I finally was interested in was called Afria. And I was very happy with my position in Afria. But then uh, Afria and uh, Tilray merged. And that put me in a bit of a conundrum because I really liked Afria, but I really did not like Tilray. And so I had to sort of decide, okay, now I get the one I like together with the one I dislike. Is the final entity going to be more like Tilray or more like Afria? I was hoping for it to be more like Efri and it turned out to be more like Tilray. And then in retrospect, that should have been the time for me to get out of that position, which I've then done later. Also, I would say that I think many things in this industry are happening slower than I originally hoped they would. And I also think the final profit margin may be lower than I previously anticipated. I think that this is still a great company. It's something I could potentially be investing in again in the future, but I'm always, you know, uh, the worst investments in my portfolio are always at risk of being replaced by the best investments I haven't made yet. And so sometimes, you know, there's an investment that could potentially be fine, but I just want to have something else instead. And so I get rid of something and invest in something else. And that's what happened to, uh, to this one. Why did you sell Google? So that turned out to be quite a good uh, timing yet again uh, on my behalf. Um, whenever I buy or sell something, it's not because like, this thing happened and that caused this. It's always the totality of things added up. You know, that's a company. It has a future. All of, you know, everything they've done, everything they will do, everything I know adds up to my valuation of the company and how that stacks up against other investments I could make. And I don't think it's, you know, it has impacted it a lot. What I have seen in Microsoft in that collaboration with OpenAI uh, deliver and that was certainly part of why I uh, reduced my Google position um, at what has turned out to be quite a good, uh, uh, yeah, a good timing. Will ChatGPT be the next big breakthrough? I think the simple answer is yes. Um, I've been uh, following OpenAI very closely every day uh, since uh, 2017, at least when uh, when OpenAI uh, uh, defeated a Dendi in a one v one Dota game when everybody was uh, only looking at COVID, I was looking more at open A at that time. And that also means that my thinking on where this technology will take us is five to six years ahead of many other people's. And it means that my whole portfolio now is already really well calibrated for all the different scenarios that I have envisioned could happen with this. Um, and it, it certainly is a big part of my evaluation of many companies, what I think will happen with this type of technology over the next years. Will AI be useful for investing? It certainly already is. What you can, uh, what you can do, you know, it, it's been uh, very useful for investing for many years in uh, in certain aspects. It's also very um, bad in many aspects in the way that there are so many PhDs uh, that are trying to use um, advanced statistical methods on the same data that they've actually driven the profitability from that side of investment down to next to nothing, no alpha. And uh, that, that, so, so there's a lot of people who are caught up, get caught in a trap there where they think they're smart and they are smart, but unfortunately they're doing something that's not unique. And that means that there's no, no alpha to be gained there. In, uh, but applied in the right way, it's amazing. And I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm using a, a chat GPT every day now. It's, it's it really, really made my research task in a certain way much, much better. And as I improve my, uh, my ability to, to write prompts in the right way and you know, add in all the things at the start to set it off in the right direction, it's really, really, uh, it's really, really become an amazing, amazing tool. Has your risk profile changed? So for most of my time on eToro, um, from all the first years, my risk score on eToro was a four. So eToro measures our risk on a scale from a one to 10, where if, if it's 10, you get kicked out of the popular investor program pretty fast. And mine has generally been around a four. Then in the past two years, it rose to five, and now it's a back down on a four again. And um, I can always see sort of 
which positions are adding to my, my, my risk level. And I always have to evaluate whether I think it's worthwhile. Sometimes I think that a constellation of companies or an outsized position in a certain company is worth the risk. So I think, okay, the excess return that I'll be getting from this is worth this extra risk right now. And there are other times where the opposite is the case. I think I'm not getting, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not seeing a particular reward for this risk. Why don't I reduce the risk here a little bit and get sort of that risk reduction for, you know, uh, only a very small impact to my expected return. So that's something I'm always sort of uh, uh, working on. But my risk target has always been a medium level, which I consider the four to five level uh, uh, to be. So delivering the highest expected return at that medium level. And that's the risk level that I decided originally is appropriate for myself. And that I think that, you know, the many uh, of my friends and family members that are copying me, uh, that it's appropriate for them. And then then sort of that's, uh, that, yeah, that's what I've gone for. And that's what I'll continue to, uh, to, to go for. Is your strategy in 2023 different to previous years? So yes, my, uh, my investment principles, those uh, six ones outlined at the beginning, they have uh, been the same all along. They are here right now and they'll probably stay the same. But what I invest in is always changing. So when I invest in a company, you know, I'm hoping to own that company forever, but as prices and circumstances and my outlook for the future changes, the assets that I want to own change. And when I started investing on eToro in 2013, my investment strategy had a name. I called it Californication based off of the Red Hot Chili Peppers album and based off of my, uh, I had recently been uh, to San Francisco for the second or third time then. And I really had this strong belief that the technology and culture of California would sweep the world. And my vision back then on what the future would be like is very close to the uh, life we are all living right now. And now I have a different view for what the future would be like 10 years and 20 years from now. Could be, you know, between here and here, but there's also a little bit of sense that all roads lead to Rome. And so, you know, that's a new strategy under a new name and my portfolio is aligned for that. And over the next years, that means that there'll be different kinds of investments that I'll be making when the, you know, the, 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 the price is right. Would you advise to copy open trades? So I can't really advise any individual on anything because for to do that, you need to uh, know the individual uh, uh, preferences and uh, financial circumstances and so forth. In general, when copying me, it's best to copy open trades. If you um, copy open trades, you invest in the same positions that I've invested in, in the same original percentages. And when I uh, invest in something, you invest in the same. When I sell something, you sell the same and so forth. If you instead uh, don't tick copy open trades, then you only uh, copy new trades. I, uh, on average, make three trades per week, but so then it'll take some time uh, to uh, get all that money invested and the portfolio will look um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quite uh, strange way for some time. So that's sometimes, but most of the case, not the best way to do it. How do I get paid dividends? Is it automatic? So yes, that's fully automatic. When companies in my portfolio and my copiers portfolios, when they pay out dividends, we receive those dividends on eToro. When I then reinvest those dividends, you know, maybe I receive a dividend from JP Morgan, happy to receive this dividend. I invested to buy some shares in a different company. Then all the copiers do exactly the same. So that's automatic. And when you look at um, your returns numbers in eToro, you can see, okay, I made 8%. That's including the uh, dividends. So you don't have to do any extra calculation to, uh, to, to see that. And everybody can go into their account statements and see you know, exactly which dividends they were paid when by which company. What's the average uh, time for holding a stock? So for me now, it's 22 months. I think on average in markets, it's 10 months. Um, my uh, target when I buy a stock is a holding period of forever. I'm buying a company because I evaluate that all the cash flows they can deliver from now on until the end of time, calculated as a net present value, is worth much more than what I have to pay to, uh, to own a part of this company today. So I'm buying this company because I want to own this company. I'm not buying it because I believe that I can sell it at a higher price tomorrow or that other people are going to see what I see suddenly. No, I'm buying it because I think it's worth it. But then things change. You know, after a few years, everybody else suddenly realized the same thing that I realized. And, you know, now the price is suddenly a lot higher, reflecting what I saw. And then maybe at that time, it's time for me to sell that and get into something else. Or maybe other things change, you know. But when I'm buying something, it's always, even when I'm owning something, 
it's always with forever in mind. Everything I have right now is what I want to have right now based on what I think is worth now compared to the prices right now. But that's something to change. That was uh, all the questions that I received in advance. So now I'll go through some uh, questions from the chat. If you, uh, if you have a question, yes, then please uh, write it in the chat now. And uh, if you don't have a question now, but you think of one later, then you can um, always uh, comment on any of my posts on eToro or uh, write to me directly on LinkedIn or watch some of my other uh, videos on YouTube. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for all the questions that were asked in advance. And now I'll, uh, I'll go into the, the chat here. I noticed the India ETF in your portfolio is one of your more prominent position. What made you pick this ETF instead of either one that covers companies from many different emerging countries or just another emerging country than India? Do you consider India the most attractive emerging country for uh, stock investing? So uh, I have lived in India myself. Um, I did MBA exchange to uh, Bangalore. I have lots of Indian friends. I know a lot of uh, really amazing Indian companies that I include in this index. When you are investing in an ETF, you know, you can go in and see all of the different companies that are included and, um, and, I've compared the different options that were available. And this is just the one that I think is the best one. And I like it so much that I decided to have a very big position in it. And I think India has extraordinary potential. I think it's an amazing country. I think there's lots of bad things in India and there are lots of really, really good things. And if the government and the management teams of these companies, they, they sort of just do a decent job, then, then we'll see some really, really amazing things happening here. And then uh, us investors should be... Uh, really uh, extraordinarily rewarded for this. And I think it also, you know, it helps with the geographical diversification to have uh, some places that are, that are just uh, in, you know, in, in a whole different, uh, different kind of a region of the world. The U.S. market makes up a very large share of the global stock market. And, you know, many uh, American companies also have amazing assets in India and are expanding in India. So even if you are investing in, in non-Indian companies, you can still have uh, exposure to the Indian market. And of course, there are many Indian companies that we'll see selling more and more abroad in the future. But yeah, it's, it's, like, it's a great ETF. There are other options. And I, you know, I'm always uh, comparing these to see which one I prefer. And yeah, this, is the, this is certainly the one that I prefer. How much substance do you think the latest hype about ChatGPT and Google's upcoming alternative has? And to what extent will it influence your portfolio? It's already influenced it massively, not because of what it can do today, but because of you know the last few years I've been envisioning what this will do eventually. Don't judge these tools for what they can do today. I'm really, really annoyed whenever I see some talk or some video that goes through like, oh, look at what a chat GPT can do right now. It's like, yeah, that, that's what it can do right now. Like, you know, when I saw uh, OpenAI's uh, first uh, match versus, you know, one guy in, in Dota, you know, that, that, was, that, was, that was decent. You know, many people had their big AI moment, the people who are older than me, when uh, Kasparov lost the chess match. My big AI moment was when I saw um, OpenAI's uh, Dota squad pull off an amazing bluff in a game of Dota. That was like, this is creativity of the highest level. This is going places. Like, like this is going to be absolutely amazing what we can do with these things very, very, very soon. We have the technology, we just sort of got to commercialize it. And then the impacts from that can be quite counterintuitive. And I've thought long and hard, long and hard about what that's going to do. And then, you know, based off of those long, you know, uh, series of epiphanies and uh, reevaluations and feeling like, oh, I'm not sure about this. And that's, uh, that's, that's turn to the portfolio I have today and you know as uh, we learn more and as we see things you know maybe I'll suddenly uh, 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 change my mind or something but I think we've sort of like seen nothing yet and and really get out of your sort of focus on the present think like years down the line don't think about what won't matter 10 years from now think about sort of you know people uh, overestimate what can be accomplished in one year and underestimate what can be accomplished in a decade and with this we can truly uh, uh, do extraordinary things in a decade I think. What's your opinion about the chances of rebounds in the short to medium term perspective of these sectors, ETF funds, cloud computing, fintech, digital security? So yeah, again, I don't care about the short term um, at all. I don't care about the medium term either. If I invest in a company, it's because I think that I've seen something here that others haven't. And that does not mean I expect everybody else to see the same in the short or medium term. It quite often means the opposite, you know. So I, I have no uh, position about what they're going to do in the short to medium term because that would mean me trying to spend a lot of time thinking about what other people are thinking. That's not what I do. I focus on what I think 
is going to happen in the long term and what I really think things will become worth. And that's what I base my, my analysis of. I don't spend any time worrying about what's going to happen in the short term and medium term. And so I don't have any, uh, any view on that, but, um, except the view that it's not important. Yeah, but great presentation. Most investors are predicting a market downturn again in 2023, mostly because the predicted uh, earnings uh, per share is falling, which tends to be a leading indicator to market movements. What's your view on this and how are you adjusting your strategy? You have a high exposure to tech stocks and these might be impacted. So again, I don't care about the short term. When you look, it's, it's really, you know, what uh, things are risky is really different depending on your time horizon. There are um, certain assets where if you are investing with a more than 20 year time horizon, you have a negative risk premium to an asset, where if you're only looking at a one to two year horizon, you're having a positive uh, risk premium for that particular asset. So your time horizon really, really uh, uh, causes that to be different. Whether a company is going to sell a little bit more or less in the next year, or maybe you know the money that we measure the stock price in is going to be worth a little bit more or less because of the interest rate policy and the loan decisions of banks, that's not what determines the value of a company in the long term. It's sort of like deciding whether or not to buy a house based on whether the weather forecast is good or bad for next weekend. It, it, that is really the best analogy you can do. And the more you think about it, the more you realize that that's sort of quite an accurate analogy. Earnings per share is a junk metric. Um, in, in any basic corporate finance one-on-one -on -one class, you will uh, learn that price earnings and any similar metrics are really, really useless. Like the correct way to think about companies is, uh, you know, is in terms of size, the enterprise value, the correct way to think about how much they're, you know, uh, delivering or can deliver is free cash flow, and uh, earnings per share metrics are often used by economists because it's an easy one to quickly use when they don't really... Uh, want to spend time to understand companies or even, you know, maybe they've forgotten what they learned about uh, corporate finance or something. It's, it's, it's actually baffles me why people use, uh, use some of these metrics, but uh, yeah, they do. Just out of curiosity, how can we see the exposure of a portfolio to every market, US, China, or Nitoro? If we can't, can you let us know in this call, ballpark numbers are fine. Yeah, so my, uh, my exposure is uh, about uh, market average for US, slightly below market average for China, slightly um, more for Europe, and about on par with the remainder of the emerging markets, except Africa, where I don't really have much. I think there is, um, there is uh, one... Uh, one uh, application that's made um, called a bull sheet. Uh, sorry for the language, but that's the name of the application. And you can use that one to sort of see a, see a breakdowns of portfolios in, a, in, in, in different ways. So uh, maybe that's an interesting one to have a, have a look at. Is it the right time to invest? So anybody who has assets has to decide how they're going to place these assets. If you have a lot of cash, like no decision is a decision. That means that you've parked all your money in cash. If you have a house, you know, then you have a house then your money is packed in a house effectively. If you don't have any stocks, you know, and you choose to not have any stocks, then that's an investment decision. So you can't really escape it. Then the question is, you know, is it now the time to own stocks compared to, for instance, just having a lot of cash? And there, I think the pace for stocks is much better than for cash. You know, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen next quarter or next year or so forth, but over a long time horizon, stocks have historically an average yielded 7% per year. That's effectively uh, equivalent to doubling uh, your investment value every decade. Cash, on the other hand, has an average uh, lost value every year. So if you're looking over a long time horizon, stocks is, you know, based off of the profit metrics you are seeing now and uh, the ones you can, you know, potentially expect, it's just a much, much better asset class to have. So if someone, you know, just has a lot, a lot of cash and no stocks, it is, uh, you know, potentially at least worth considering uh, that, you know, you may want to have some stocks actually. What do you think about the future of Metaverse? So I think that in the current state of uh, virtual reality uh, headsets, it's not a very enjoyable product. People don't want to use it for a very long uh, time. And there are lots of uh, problems associated with it. And that's sort of okay. Sometimes, you know, something is bad until it's good. And then when it's good, that's when it takes off. And, you know, in Meta with the rebranding and with the investments in this area, you know, um, it could potentially eventually do something interesting here, but so could some other companies. So then what's going to be the, you know, the total market size, what's going to be the profitability, how is that going to shift value from some places to some others and so forth. That's something, you know, one has to take into account. And just because someone calls themselves meta doesn't mean that they're going to, you know, own the totality of this, uh, this market. And um, just because, um, you know, uh, 
some companies are developing the technology here doesn't mean that they will be the ones to reap all the benefit of, of this new technology. But I think long term, it's a very, very interesting, uh, interesting field. It's certainly, you know, um, yeah, it's one of the most interesting technologies for the long term. Uh, the dividends copier gets going into the copier balance or into the amount I'm copying with. So it's going into the amount uh, you're copying with. So um, then, you know, it's there as cash. Uh, I see it as cash. It's cash in uh, your copy. And then when I reinvest it, then the uh, copy is automatically also reinvested. And then then it, it stays in there. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's, that's how, you know, uh, portfolios compound. So we invest in companies, these companies, they, you know, potentially they keep the cash and just keep growing, or maybe they decide they're going to send back the cash uh, to us. And then, you know, we have to decide what to do with this cash. And that for me always means reinvesting it so that, you know, uh, the portfolio can, can, uh, can compound. Can we invest in open AI right now? Certainly, uh, that's been uh, on my mind uh, since I first heard about this uh, company. And I was like, this is the future. This is the future. This is the future. And now we are indirectly invested in it through our stake held via Microsoft. And that's the case with many new cool technologies. Sometimes that some of the big companies that we're invested in, they own stakes in these uh, companies. And so right now with OpenAI, the best way to take a stake is uh, is is uh, is uh, via via Microsoft. Tell us what you think about Bitcoin. So I love the idea of a private currency. Um, I think money through history has gone through uh, many evolutionary stages, and I have in my mind sort of the long term ideal view of a currency that's not Bitcoin. But you know, if I had to design a sci fi world and they had to have the optimal system, you know, it's it's a quite a a different kind of a kind of system, but a stepping stone of that journey could very well be something like Bitcoin. I don't like uh, the underlying blockchain technology. I think that's a trash technology that's way overhyped of all the technologies in the world. I think that's the one that's received the most media coverage compared to how useless it is. I think, however, that Bitcoin with some additional uh, technologies with some different, um, something like the Lightning Network or other um, equivalents that can enable us to use, um, uh, I guess the analogy is that, you know, back in the day, if you had some gold and you wanted to buy something, you could then transport that gold and give it to someone. And then, you know, now they had the gold, but then people found out, oh, why don't I just make a piece of paper that specifies that you can go, uh, you know, uh, into a branch of Standard Charter Bank in India and, you know, deliver some gold. And then you can take a piece of paper and you can put that uh, in, uh, in London when you get back home and you can collect some gold again. And then you don't have to transport the gold all the way overseas with the risk that it gets stolen or sunk. Um, you know, then you found out that you can transact in gold in better and better and better ways, and you don't have to move the gold around all the time. And in the same way, we can uh, develop technologies that allow us to transact in Bitcoin really smoothly in a fast, cheap, secure way without uh, making changes on the, you know, on, on the blockchain all the time. And if we can do that, then we can have Bitcoin as, you know, Bitcoin stays Bitcoin, but the way we transact in Bitcoin changes. I don't think it has to be both a great currency and a great transaction system. It's enough that it's a great currency. And if it can just be that, then I think it can have a really, really extraordinary future, especially as, you know, we're seeing even the best the managed currencies of the world really, really failing at achieving their inflation targets, really, really taking some uh, hits to their credibility. And I think not to an extent that we cannot trust the central banks now, not to an extent that sort of a, but, you know, that is not to say that at some point we will not see even worse hits to the credibility. If we were to see that, then certainly nice for the world to have something like this as a as an alternative. And it is, um, yeah. So in that way, I really really like it. Looking back in 2017, you gained 148 percent. Were you using the same strategy back then with the same risk score? So the assets I held were different. The assets that really uh, delivered highly in that year were. Um, uh, uh, Bitcoin, for instance, uh, Nvidia, uh, Amazon. Also, I managed to sort of hedge my position a lot with oil, which was a way for many years I used oil as a way to keep my risk score lower. Now I don't use oil anymore, so I'm keeping the risk score lower in different ways. Um, but yeah, and every, every year it's been different assets that have been delivered that high return. But at no point has it been just one asset. If you look at, for instance, Bitcoin, when I first bought Bitcoin, that was at a very low price and it uh, comprised about a uh, a half percent of the portfolio. Then it grew to comprise uh, five percent of the portfolio, I think. And then at that point, I reduced the position massively again. At any time, it's always been, you know, the uh, a lot of different positions uh, delivering the total return because of that sort of uh, high level of diversification. 
I see you hold UBS. How do you think about risks, opportunities in banking sector now? Uh, for instance, rising interest income versus uh, risk of loan losses if recession. How did you choose to focus on UBS over others like a JP Morgan or even value play like Citigroup? So I have my uh, uh, way that I use to value uh, banks and uh, different financial services companies. Some of these large financial services companies, you know, you can break out into multiple sort of companies in one because, of course, investment banking is a different uh, industry than asset management, which is different from retail banking to commercial banking and transaction banking and so forth. And then there are some synergies between these areas. Goldman Sachs has recently, you know, dropped out of the whole retail race because maybe the synergies they were hoping with there weren't really there. And based off of that, you know, I... Uh, I evaluate the different financial services companies in, in, in you really getting that 360 degree view of them and comparing one another and stacking them up. And based on that, this is the one that I've liked a lot more than the others for a long time. And then, you know, that's also been a very uh, well-performing one compared to the others. So that's just, you know, it, it helped me uh, make a, a lot of money on this one. And I think now it's in a absolutely unique position and it, it, there's just no competition for what they do effectively it's really really a, a strong unique position they put themselves in did you consider sony when picking nintendo it seems to be doing really well lately in soaking up dollars spent in the sector so you know uh, those are different companies and i uh, some of there are some overlaps of course and the, 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 the for instance the uh, creative ip for games um and uh you know, maybe in the ability to to take some of that and turn it into movies. Sony's also got lots of other things they're doing that are really, really interesting. I don't sort of uh, go country by country. So it's not like today's Japan Day. Let me look at uh, at uh, companies that are from Japan or headquartered in Japan or have a, you know, a history in Japan. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I compare companies all the time. And so, it's, you know, of course, I compare them in certain ways, but I also look at them very detailed individually and there's never two companies that are, you know, like for like com comparable. You got to evaluate the whole company and make a view on that and you evaluate the whole company and make a view of that. And then you take those total things and compare them. Um, I don't like this side. Like I want a Japanese company, which one should it be? Okay, I should you know, do this one. How did you select Dior over say uh, LVMH and uh, Hermé? Uh, did you consider Montclair? Uh, yes. Uh, so for all of these companies, I'm certainly not a, 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 a fashion expert. So in order to understand that part of it, I survey people that I know and I ask them, you know, how is this brand compared to that? How is this compared to that? What do you think about this? What I can really contribute with myself is an understanding of the financial statements of these companies, um, what they're acquiring at what prices. And, you know, I, I meet with people from these companies as well to, to sort of really try to get an understanding of, you know, what, what, what's, what's happening. And then, for the totality of this industry, I have a view on what's going to be important in the future, which things are really providing sustainable competitive advantages. And then based on all of these things, I get my valuations of these different companies. And from these, you know, I managed to quite in nice order invest the most in the ones that perform the best. And then, you know, with various adjustments, I've now positioned my money in the way that I think is going to deliver me the best value. And, you know, I'm always updating my analysis methods i have a you know framework for things that i know that i need to know and things where that i you know where i know i need to learn more and so those are in a tiered uh, list the ones that i focus on so okay i need to know more about this so i'm going to learn more about this and with all of the great uh, tools in the world online and the ability to talk to the right people about the right things uh, i'm usually able to sort of by spending a lot of time, get to a good sort of a view on what a company is worth. You'll see in my portfolio a bias towards industries where I've myself been a management consultant, um, but I'm also able, if I spend enough time, to understand you know many different industries. All right, um, that was all the time we had. Thank you very much for uh, all the questions and everybody who uh, watched here live. And uh, yeah, let's have a, a great quarter, everybody.